So today's discussion is on Newton's method of final applications of derivatives. Um, Newton's method is also a message from the past, you know, to us here in the future from Newton. It's kind of remarkable. So Newton's method is what's known as a numerical algorithm, and it's specifically designed to solve this root finding problem, f of x equal to zero. So starting out with some given function f of x, if we want to solve f of x equal to zero, Newton's method would be one numerical strategy for solving that. So I want to talk about this word here, which is kind of important, this word algorithm. So an algorithm is a set of instructions on how to perform a task. It's, it's a recipe, essentially. And so the concept of an algorithm to me is revolutionary for two reasons. The first idea behind the algorithm is that the person carrying out the algorithm doesn't really need to know what's going on. All they need to be able to do is carry out each step of the instructions of the algorithm. And then if they can carry out the steps, the instructions, then they can perform the task. So that's one, one big idea that if I have an algorithm, if I have a list of instructions, then we can have a person do it who doesn't even know what they're doing. They just have to be able to carry out the instructions. So that's one big idea. The second big idea is, you know, well, why does it even have to be a person? If we can create a machine that can carry out the steps and follow the instructions in each step, then the machine which knows nothing will be able to perform a task. So the Euclidean algorithm was developed, you know, 500 BC. And at that point, mathematicians are already imagining a machine that can do math. You know, and that machine is called a tractor. No, it's called a computer, right? So, you know, that's why the concept of algorithm is really important. It leads us directly to the idea of, you know, the mathematician's dream is to build an artificial brain. And a computer is, you know, just one step in, in, in the journey towards that ultimate goal. Because we would like to build an artificial brain that can do science, that can do math, that can discover new results. You know, basically we want to find a machine that'll do our homework for us, basically. So the concept of an algorithm leads us to this idea of a computer. And, you know, obviously that has changed our world in ways we can't even believe. And <clears throat> Newton's method, when Newton created this method, it's obvious that he understood that one day there would be machines that could do computations because this method isn't practical to do by hand. So here's how Newton's method works. It generates a sequence, a discrete sequence or enumerated list of guesses. So here I want to talk about the notation first here, x sub one, x sub two, x sub three. So here x sub one represents our first guess. And the one here just represent that this was the first choice. Is x sub one equal to one? Not necessarily. x sub one could be equal to any number. x sub two, this represents our second guess. And x sub three represents our third guess. And here we're trying to guess a solution to this f of x equal to zero problem, okay? So that's one thing, and I'll mention the notation again. And so the way Newton's method works is starting with a given guess x one, I'll show you the method. There's a method to generate a list or sequence of guesses. And hopefully, you know, the guesses are getting closer and closer to the root. We hope that as n gets larger, f of x n, the y value at each guess gets closer and closer to zero. That's what we're hoping if the algorithm is working. Does the algorithm always work? No. Um, and so here I made the comment again about the notation. In general, when you see x by itself, that usually represents a variable. But if you see an x sub n, that usually represents a constant. So when I see x sub n in my mind, I always think, aha, uh -huh, that's kind of, that's like a fixed number. Whereas if I just see x, I go, okay, that's, that's a variable. That could be any real number. So here's a visual picture of how Newton's method works. So I'm trying to find this x value right here where the function goes to the x-axis. I'm going to start by randomly picking a point 
and then finding the tangent line of that point. And now the theory is, if we can approximate a function by its tangent line, maybe we can approximate the x-intercept of the function line using the x-intercept of the tangent line. And so here, we find the x-intercept of this tangent line, and we call that x-intercept x sub 2. So in this way, we've used calculus to generate a guess, starting out with some random first guess x sub 1. And then we check. We take x sub 2, we plug it into the function, and we ask ourselves, does f of x sub 2 equals 0? If the answer is yes, then we're done, because that's what we're looking for. We're trying to you know, solve this root finding problem up here. If the answer is no, if f of x sub 2 is not 0, start the procedure all over again. What procedure is that? Starting here at x sub 2, go up to the curve, find the tangent line at that point, and then use the x-intercept of that new tangent line as your new guess. And I have that here in the second slide, uh, in the second picture here, sorry. And so here you can see, we've repeated the procedure. Starting from x sub two, I go up to the curve, find the tangent line, and then our next guess would be the x-intercept of that new tangent line, and we call that x sub three. And here I did a close-up so you can really see what's happening here. So starting out at x sub one, we go to the curve, and then we sketch the tangent line. And then the x-intercept here would be our, our first, our guess, our guess for the root. And then you plug that in. If it's not zero, just start the whole procedure again. So now from x sub two, I go up to the curve, I get the tangent line, I find the intersection point of the tangent line, that's my next guess. Again, take x sub 3, plug it in. It's not 0. Let me do it again. So now from x sub 3, go up to the curve. From x sub 3, go up to the curve. Draw the tangent line. And then find the x-intercept. You know, And here with this picture, it looks like the sequence of guesses is moving towards the x-intercept. It doesn't always work, though. I'll show you an example where it doesn't work. So how do we actually find the formula? So you know what's nice about Newton's method is it's an algorithm. Once we find the formula one time, then that's the only formula we'll ever have to use, because that's why you know, algorithms are recipe based. Here are the steps to solve the problem. Now follow them. You know? So that's one thing that's nice about Newton's method. It is very algorithmic once we establish the formula. The formula is not difficult at all. It's just, we're gonna find the tangent line and find the x-intercept. So I do wanna mention one other thing before we talk about the formula. I, I mentioned this on, on a previous slide. I mentioned this word discrete. And I also used um, this word here, enumerated. So the word discrete and the word enumerated are in some sense, the opposite of the word continuous. Discrete means the same thing as enumerated. Enumerated means we can count them. So here are the guesses, I can count them. Like this is the first guess, this is the second guess, this is the third guess. And so now you're thinking, wait, what, what do you mean? Are there something we can't count? Yes, the real numbers are uncountable. And it's really, this is a very fundamental concept, which I'll come back to a little bit later, but the real numbers are uncountable. So for example, suppose you were to count the real numbers. And I, I, I'll start you off. I say, okay, you started zero. What's the next real number after zero? Is it 0 0.1? Is it 0 0.01? Is it 0 0.0001? Is it 0 0.00001? Is there a next number after zero? There actually isn't. And you can't count the reals. The reals are uncountable. I think of the real numbers as where you go to a beach where the beach, the sand is made out of the finest sand like talcum powder, and you can't even scoop up the sand. Versus numbers like integers, one, two, three, four. Those are numbers, those are discrete. Those are things we can count. You know, like if I have a herd of sheep, sheep are discrete. I can count how many sheep I have, you know. But if it rains, 
rain is not discrete. I can't count how many droplets of rain have, have fallen, you know. So there's a subtle difference between continuity and being discrete or being, you know, countable versus uncountable. Anyway, at the end of the day here, Newton's method is generating a countable or discrete sequence of numbers. And hopefully these numbers are approaching the, you know, the x-intercept of our function. That, that, that's, that's the hope. Okay, so let's actually develop the algorithm. Like I said, the math is not complicated. So basically starting at x1, um, yeah, these lecture slides uh, were emailed out on Thursday morning. Um, so they should be in your email, Matthew. And I will repost them. Uh, I found a little typo. Um, so um, there was a question from the student side. So yeah, so starting at x1, we're going to just find the equation of the tangent line. So this right here is the equation of the tangent line at x1 comma f of x1. And so now I just wanna find the x-intercept. So you know, the way we find the x-intercept is we set the y variable equal to zero. So I'm gonna set this whole thing equal to zero. And so that's what I did here in this next equation. Set it equal to zero. Now I want you to pay attention here and really think about what you're looking at. X sub one, that's a constant. So f of x sub one is a constant. f prime of x sub one, that's a constant because x one is a constant. x sub one right here by itself, that is also a constant. The only variable in this equation is right here, x. So we need to solve for x. So here, I want to isolate x. So the first thing I'm going to do is move the f of x one over it'll become negative. Then I need to divide by f prime of x1, and then I need to move this minus x1 over. So here, I did all the steps at once here. Let's do this carefully. When you move the f of x1 over, you get negative f of x1. Then I divide by f prime of x1, which you see right here. Then we move this negative x1 over to the other side. It becomes positive. It's right here, x1. And so we've solved for the x-intercept. Again, I really want you to be careful and think about this here. x1 is a constant. f of x1 is a constant because x1 is a constant. And f prime of x1 is also a constant. So this thing on the left-hand side is a fixed number, is an actual number, which we're now going to call x sub 2. So this x-intercept that we just found from the tangent line at x1, uh, f of x1, is now our second guess. So we've found this x-intercept right here is exactly this x-value. And this exact this x-value we found by just setting the tangent line equal to zero and solving for x. And that's the basic recipe. You know, if I now want to do this again, I'd start the whole game over. But instead of starting with x1, f of x1, here in this equation of the tangent line, instead of having x1 here, I'm now going to start with x2. I put an x2 down here, f prime of x2, x minus x2, solve for x, and that'll give us x sub 3. So the formula here would just look like I would just uh, have, instead of x sub 1s here, we would have x sub twos in the equation. So there'd be an x sub two here, an x sub two, and an x sub two. And this would be, we would set it equal to x three, the next guess. So that would be if we went up here, found the tangent line, and then found the x-intercept. My drawing is not that good. So yeah, here's the general formula, starting with an initial guess. So, so Newton's method needs three things. One, we need this initial guess. Two, we need the function f of x. And three, we need the derivative of f. Those are the three things we need to start Newton's method. And of course, we need this formula here. And here's Newton's method formula. It's identical to this formula here. The only difference is wherever it says one, I've changed it to n. 
And here where it says two, I've changed it to n plus one. And so how do you interpret this? I almost kind of interpret it in terms of time. Like I think of x sub n as the present value of the guess and x sub n plus one is the future or next value. And we're always using a, you know, a current present value to find a future value. And once you give me a one starting point, x sub one, that starts this chain reaction. I use x one to find x two, then I use x two to find x three, then I use x three to find x four, so on and so forth. And you know, we'll talk about when we stop. Do we do this forever? No, we don't. There, there's a you know rhyme and reason to this. So by the way, with this formula, eventually you'll have to know this formula. So either you memorize it or you understand the procedure for deriving it. You know, and here you should think about what happens. Is this is for n equal to one, two, three. So for example, if I replace n with one here in this equation, well, then you get a, you get back. If I replace this n right here with one then you get back exactly the equation that we started with over here. So if I change all those to ones, then that looks exactly like this expression. And if I make n equal to one, then n plus one, n plus one here will become, will look like two if n is equal to one. Okay, so this is your generic recipe for generating x2, x3, x4, x5, starting with x1. So now here's the full procedure, the full algorithm. This is Newton's method for solving, and I put the word solving in quotes, f of x equal to zero, because we're not actually solving f of x equal to zero. What we're doing is we're numerically approximating a solution. We're numerically trying to basically using a very you know, fancy trial and error type of method. You know, we're not randomly picking points. We're picking points with some sort of calculus involved but we are just doing trial and error. So starting with some function f of x to, uh, to find a solution, to approximate a solution to the root equation here, f of x equal to zero, or you know, the x-intercept equation. Pick a starting guess. Usually this can be any number. If you can use the graph of the function, if possible, to, to, to pick a, a starting point that's close to the root, that's nice, but it, it's not necessary. Typically you can start with any number. And then use the iterative formula Iterative means the formula basically repeats upon itself, you know, so I can use x1 and this formula right here, x sub n plus one minus x uh, equals x sub n minus f of x sub n over f prime of x sub n. I can use x1 and this formula to find x sub two. Then I can use x2 and this formula to find x sub three. Then I can use x sub three and this formula to find x sub four. And in this way we generate this enumerated, discrete, countable list of guesses. And how do we know if it's working? Well, it's, it's not very complicated. We literally take each guess and plug it into the function. If the function, if the values are getting closer and closer to zero, as, you know, we, as we give you more and more guesses, then Newton's method is working. Again, I'll show you an example here. Um, and here in this picture, you know, for this function, it certainly seems like Newton's method seems to be heading towards this x-intercept. These lists, this sequence of guesses seems to be moving towards that x-intercept. So I wanted to start with a, a kind of a toy problem where everything is kind of set up perfectly for Newton's method. And this is a bit unrealistic, but it's a good starting point for us. And then of course, we'll make things you know slightly more complicated. So here, it's a root finding problem. We want to approximate the root of x plus uh, x cubed plus three x plus one. Um, and here we're giving a given a starting point x sub one equal to zero, and we want to find two iterations. I want to use x one to find x two, and then I want to use x two to find x three. So for Newton's method, I need a function. Here the function is x cubed plus three x plus one. And here, you know, we're trying to solve this root finding problem here, f of x equal to zero. That's the format we need to have this problem in before we can use Newton's method. So now, once I know f of x, I can find f prime of x. So if f of x is 
x cubed plus 3x plus 1, f prime of x would be 3x squared plus 3 by the power rule. So now I can set up my Newton's method formula. So here, x of n plus 1 equals x of n minus f of x of n over f prime of x of n. I'm just going to now basically plug x sub n into this function for the numerator and plug x sub n into 3x squared plus 3 for the denominator. So when I do that, I get this. So I emailed out these notes on Thursday morning, and the notes you have might have a typo. They may not have these ends here. So when I wrote the notes, I had a typo here. I forgot to include the ends, and I just had x cubed plus 3x plus 1 in my numerator, and I fixed that. I found the typo this morning, and so I'll repost these. So at this point, you're basically done. You can start generating guesses in theory. I can now take x sub 1, plug it in here to find x sub 2, and then use x sub 2 to find x sub 3. But typically, when we're going to put this in a calculator or a computer, so by the way, when you're doing these Newton's method problems on WebAssign and the homework, you should expect to use a calculator. So Newton understood that one day there would be machines that can do math and make calculations, and, and he created this method. This is not a method that's practical to do by hand. And certainly Newton understood that. Remember, he's working by candlelight with a quill and feather and ink but he created this method knowing that someday there would be machines. So to put this in a computer, I want to simplify it. So I'm going to combine the fractions. I'm going to multiply x sub n top and bottom by 3 x sub n squared plus 3. So they're all over this common denominator. So when I multiply x sub n by 3 x sub n squared plus 3, I get that. One other thing I want to mention is just an algebra point of view. Remember here, we should put parentheses around this numerator term. And this minus sign distributes to all three terms. Be very careful with that. So here, 3xn cubed minus xn cubed is going to be 2xn cubed. The 3xn right here minus 3xn, that's going to cancel. And then this minus gets distributed to the 1 over here. So when you simplify the numerator, you get 2xn cubed minus 1 over 3xn squared plus 3. And so here's my algorithm for Newton's method. And up to this point, or even in fact, this right here is typically what we're looking for in a Newton's method problem. You know, what's the, what's the, the equation that we're going to use to generate our guesses? So that's the first part. Using the function, the derivative, and the formula for Newton's method, I've come up with a recipe. Now let's use the recipe to generate guesses starting with n equal to 1. Here, if you let n equal to 1 in the formula, this is the recipe we get. So you should look at this equation and realize what we've done is I've replaced the n right here. I've replaced all of these n's, this one, this one down here, and this one, with a 1. And so it looks exactly, you know, like this. 2x sub 1 cubed minus 1. 3x sub 1 squared plus 3. On the other side, 1 plus 1 is 2. So on the other side, I have x sub 2. Now we do the math. Now I'm going to plug in 0 for x sub 1. So I get 2 times 0 cubed minus 1 divided by 3 times 0 squared plus 3. I get negative 1 third. This is our first guess that we get from Newton's method. Here's my x sub 2. So x starting with x sub 1, using Newton's method, we're able to generate the next iteration is negative 1 third. And now what I should do is plug it into the function and check if it's equal to 0. I'll do that in one second. Here, here the question specifically asks us to go all the way to x sub 3. So let me do one more iteration. So now let n equal to 2. Plug n equal to 2 in this formula over here. Wherever it says n, that'll become a 2. Wherever it says n plus 1, that'll become a 3. So I get the formula for x sub 3 is 2 x sub 2 cubed minus 1 divided by 3 x sub 2 squared plus 3. And we saw from before x sub 2 equals negative 1 third. So now I'm substituting negative 1 third in for x sub 2 wherever it occurs. 
Now, just one algebra comment here that might cause some confusion. So I noticed there's this denominator right here that's in the numerator of three cubed. So what I did was to get rid of that is I multiplied top and bottom by three cubed. And now remember this three cubed needs to, to distribute to each term. When it multiplies to the two times minus one, you know, minus one third cubed, this denominator term cancels. The minus one here will become a three cubed. In the denominator, there's minus one third squared. So the minus sign will go away. The three squared in the denominator and the three cubed will cancel, but there will be one three left over. So when you just do the algebraic simplification, this is what it looks like. Just multiplying top and bottom by three cubed. And now I do the math. Negative two minus 27 is negative 29 over nine plus 81, three to the fourth is 81. So we get negative 29 over 90. Here is our next iteration. So starting with the given x sub one equal to zero, we were able to use Newton's method and generate x sub two which was negative one third. And then using X sub two and Newton's method, we're able to generate X sub three, which is negative 29 over 90. So let's check how good are these. So I plug them back into the function. So I'm plugging in this guess into the original function F of X. And when I do that, you see it's fairly close to zero. It's accurate to one digit. When I, when I plug it in, I get this is approximately negative 0 0.037, blah, blah, blah. But it's accurate to one decimal place. It's getting there. If we plug in negative 29 over 90, then you see it's accurate to three decimal points. So not bad for just two iterations. And for doing it by hand, if we had a computer, and more iterations, that gives us more accuracy. So Newton understood that one day we would have machines that could do these rudimentary arithmetic calculations. And he created this method for that time, which is now. Um, I mean, it's a very simple but very powerful method that's still in use today. So I should mention that Newton's method is a starting point for a whole new field of math called numerical analysis. So as engineers, you'll take a class called computational methods or numerical analysis, and, and Newton's method will be kind of one of the jump off points. And it's about how do you use a computer to solve problems? So here's a great problem that's a you know, very classic Newton's method problem. Use Newton's method to approximate the sixth root of 47 to eight digits of accuracy. And they give us a starting value of X sub one equal to 1.5. So here, it's not obvious what the function is. So that's why I say this is a good problem. So here, let's start with the most profound statement in algebra. Six, the sixth root of 47 is unknown, so let's call it x. Let x equal the sixth root of 47. Now watch, I'm gonna use this equation to build a function. I'm gonna make this a root finding problem. First, raise both sides of the equation to the sixth power. So I get x to the sixth equals 47. Now move the 47 to the left-hand side. I get x to the sixth minus 47 equals zero. This is a root finding problem. I'm going to define x to the sixth minus 47 to be the function f of x. And so now we've reduced the problem of approximating the sixth root of 47. We've reduced that to a root finding problem. If I can find the root of this function, x to the sixth minus 47, I would have also found or approximated you know, the sixth root of 47. So that part to me, all of this stuff right here would be a great test question where I would just ask you, what's the formula for Newton's method to approximate the sixth root of 47? Not even asking for any iterations. So here now we know the function. So I, I can set up Newton's method. Of course, I need the derivative. So we know the derivative of x to the sixth minus 47 is six x to the fifth. So x to the sixth minus 47, the derivative of six x to the fifth. 
I got the derivative, I got the function, and I have a starting point. That's all we need for, and of course, I need the formula for Newton's method. So there we go. Now we can start Newton's method. So as I said, I'm gonna simplify this algebraically just so that you know, when you put it in a computer or when you're putting it in your calculator, it makes it a lot easier if you simplify it as much as possible. So here I'm gonna multiply the x sub n top and bottom by six x sub n to the fifth because I want everything to have this common denominator of six x sub n to the fifth power. So you get six of n to the sixth in the numerator when you multiply, and then when I do the algebra, I get, here's a great formula to use to, to plug into your calculator or computer. I even simplified it a little more. Either one of those would be a great answer. And, and I think just this part here would be a nice question to ask, you know, like on a test or whatever, just that part. What's the formula in Newton's method to approximate the six through to 47? And, and we'd be looking for either one of these as, as a final answer. But here, I want to talk about this eight digits of accuracy. Okay, so let me keep going with this problem. What, how do we find eight digits of accuracy? All that means is that we run Newton's method until our guesses stop changing for eight digits. So starting with 1.5 in MATLAB, I generated the guesses. And the first guess was 2.28. The next guess was 2.02. .02. Then it was 1.91, 1.9. At this point, we're already starting to have some kind of convergence. Then I got 1.89969131. This seventh guess had already converged. You see it's not changing for one, two, three, four, five digits after the decimal point. So here we've already gotten, if they'd said approximate this to you know five digits of accuracy, we'd be done here with 1.89969. But I ran it until it stopped changing for eight digits. So here, if you compare these two, the seventh iteration and the eighth iteration, they don't change. The eight digits are identical. So at this point, you know, this is what we would say, oh, we've approximated the solution to x to the six minus 47 accurately to eight digits. And you know, if you wanted more digits, you'd run Newton's method until you got more digits of convergence. Here, I, I was only showing eight digits because that's all I'm interested in. So after running it to the point where it stops changing after eight digits, we, we make our conclusion that you know, the root of this equation, which is the sixth root of 47, the solution of you know, the, the x-intercept of this equation, which is the sixth root of 47, according to Newton's method, to eight digits of accuracy is this mess right here. And let me switch over to MATLAB here. And I wanna show you the code and run that for you. So uh, MATLAB share. All right, so here's MATLAB. So you may or may not know that CU Boulder students get a free license to MATLAB and Mathematica, and you should download those, go to the OIT website. You may or may not also know that in APPM in Calc 3, there's a computer project, and in differential equations, there's a computer project. In Calc 3, the computer project is in Mathematica. In differential equations, the computer project is in MATLAB, okay? Either way, if you're going to be in science or if you're going to be an engineer, you're going to have to learn some scientific computing. So here's the MATLAB environment. Here's the code I wrote. I'm not the greatest code writer. I just wanted to show you some code here. So anything that appears after um, a percent symbol is a comment that the computer cannot read, but only the human can read. Okay. So here I say clear all. I'm clearing the memory. CLC, I'm just clearing the console. That's down here. This is the console down here. And here I just wanted to make sure there was it was clean, there's nothing, it was empty. So I say CLC. So then format long, that just makes it so that I see eight to 16 digits when, when, it, when it gives me the answer. So here I'm defining the function. So in MATLAB, when you say F equals at X, that's the same as just saying F of X. It, I'm, I'm naming the function F and I'm letting MATLAB know that X is the independent variable. And then here's the function, X to the six minus 47. I also put in the derivative. I you know, was very original with the name. I called it f prime. It's going to be a function of x, and then here's the actual derivative, 6 times x to the fifth. 
So these two functions down here are for a different example that I'll show you later, ignore those. And here, this is my starting point of 1.5, okay? Then I start an infinite loop using a while loop. You don't really need to know any about the code. You know, I'm just kind of going through this a little bit. And here's my formula for Newton's method. X sub I plus one. So I used I instead of N. Some books use I for index, you know, because that's what that little number is called. It's called an index X sub I or X sub N. So here, X sub I plus one equals X sub I minus F of X sub I divided by F prime of X sub I. So this is exactly Newton's method. The rest of the code prints out the output and also checks for six digits of accuracy. So here I'm taking the difference of any two consecutive guesses and I'm checking to see that the difference is zero for eight digits. The ninth digit can be any number, doesn't have to be zero and I gave it maximum tolerance. The ninth digit I'm allowing to be off by as much as nine. But the eighth digits here cannot be off at all. They have to match exactly for the two guesses. All right, so if it matches, it'll break and come out of the loop. If it, if it doesn't match, if there's no break, it'll continue the loop. It'll advance the index and continue the loop forever. So let me run the code and um, let's see. So the output will appear down here. And so you see by the eighth guess, it's achieved the tolerance we're looking for. It's accurate to eight digits. You should note that these two guesses do not differ for eight digits. And so that's how I'm concluding that it's accurate to eight digits. And here, let's start far away. So we know the answer about 1.9. Let's start far away. Let me start at 5,000. So I start at 5,000, run Newton's method. It only still requires 49 guesses. You know, it starts at 5,000, then it goes to 4,000. You know, you can see the progression, but within 50 iterations, we're at the root. So I don't know, that's kind of fun. And you know, you should expect to use some sort of calculator or software when you're doing the homework for Newton's method. Okay, like I said, you know, Newton wrote this homework for the future, for a different time that had more technology than, than he had. Um, so let me head back to the slides. I'll show you that other example in a second. So by the way, you know, we are trying to find a root. So I went ahead and plugged in just to check. Remember, ultimately, Newton's method is trying to find the x-intercept of this equation. So I just wanted to check if I take this approximation that I found from Newton's method and plug it into the function, how close to zero will I get? And you can see, you know, Newton's method is doing its job. It's approximated this to, to very many digits. We, we've, we've found, you know, almost exactly the x-intercept. So just as a check. There. Did, did Newton's method do what it said it was supposed to do? So that's, you know, a really nice approximation where that I can do something with. You know, you have to ask your, yourself, how does my calculator know the 6 through to 47 is 1.899-69105? You know, this kind of math perhaps starts to answer those questions. So here's the code. I just wanted you to have a copy of it in case you wanted to look at it. You know, like I said, eventually you're going to have to learn some code, but you don't need to worry about it for this class. And here's the output. You know, the way you learn code is you read the code and you look at the output and you try and, and, and make those two things fit and make sense in your mind. Okay. Um, so here's another problem that's a little more, uh, you know, involved. It's not just straight. You can just apply Newton's method right away. So here we want to approximate the intersection point of the function cosine x and x. And here we're also asked to provide a reasonable starting guess. So remember, Newton's method is a root finding problem. So I'm gonna make this a root finding problem. You can move either one, either one of the functions to the other side, either move the X over or move the cosine over, you know, move one of them over and make this a root finding problem. See, now this is a root finding problem. And I'm gonna call this function here, cosine X minus X, I'm gonna make that the f of x in my Newton's method. So choose f of x to be cosine of x minus x. So once I have f of x, I can find f prime is minus sine x minus one, just taking the derivative. So once I have f and f prime, I can write down and the formula for Newton's method, which I'm gonna ask you to memorize. Now I can write down the formula for Newton's method. And here, let me simplify it. I'm, I'm gonna put everything over a common denominator. So 
I multiply top and bottom by minus sign x sub n minus one. And here, one thing I will mention, just remind you, algebra, we should think about there being parentheses around this numerator and this minus sign distributes to each term. And this negative x sub n, when you distribute the minus becomes a plus. And so there's a minus x sub n from multiplying x sub n top and bottom by minus sign minus one. So there's that minus of so these cancel. And so I'm able to simplify the, the formula to look that way. I also factored out a minus sign from the top and the bottom and canceled it. So when you cancel the x's, every term in the numerator and denominator have minus signs. So I factored those out and canceled it. And so here's my Newton's method formula for starters. That's the recipe we're going to use to generate the guesses, provided we have a starting guess. So now I need to provide a reasonable starting guess. Okay. So for the starting guess, I recommend you look at the graph, but be careful. I, I don't suggest you graph the function that we're using for Newton's method. Here, what I suggest you do is to go back to the original problem and graph cosine by itself and graph x by itself. And that's what I've done here. And we're basically trying to eyeball the x coordinate of that intersection point. And so now I just want to pick, basically, based on this graph, you can pick any number between this interval 0 to pi over 2. To me, looks like it would be a good starting guess. So I said choose pi over 2 or pi over 4. You know, you can certainly choose 0 or pi over 3 or pi over 6. Anything in this interval to me between 0 and pi over 2 seems to be probably good. I, I don't want to pick anything out here. You know, I'm not looking for this root. Remember that. I'm looking for the intersection point. So, okay, I'll let you think about this problem. There are many good elements to this problem. The main thing, as far as something that's testable, this would be a totally testable problem because I'm not asking to find any iterations. We're looking for the Newton's method formula and we're looking for a reasonable starting guess. You know, I wouldn't even worry about this much, this part that much. But yeah, this type of thing to understand the theory. How do I take this problem and reformulate it so that it looks like a problem we can solve with Newton's method? That's really, you know, what we're practicing here. So, hey, I'm almost going to end with one last example. Newton's method does not always work properly. Um, Newton's method, you know, there's a whole theory behind Newton's method, like I said, for numerical analysis. You know, there are, we can talk about the theory of when it converges, when it doesn't converge, we can talk about error and all that kind of stuff. But I just want to show you an example of when it doesn't work. Okay. So, this example asks us, to use Newton's method on this equation, x cubed minus 2x plus 2 equal to 0, with a starting guess of x sub 1 equal to 1, and show that it does not converge. It does not give us an answer. So if f of x is x cubed minus 2x plus 2, then the derivative is 3x squared minus 2. So with the Newton's method formula, I can create the, the iterative formula that we'll use to generate the guesses. So after doing the algebra and simplifying, I got x sub n plus 1 equals 2x sub n cubed minus 2 over 3x sub n squared minus 2. Now I'm going to take x sub 1 equal to 1 and plug it in. So I do that down here. So I've got x sub 1 equal to 1 plugged in to this equation right here. Oops right here. I'm plugging in, you can see. And then I do the math. 2 times 1 cubed is 2 minus 2 is 0. Downstairs I have 3 times 1 is 3 minus 2. So I have a 1 in the middle. I'm 0 over 1 or just 0. Fine, no problem. That's x sub 2. Now let's take x sub 2, plug it in to find x sub 3. So now I'm going to take 0 here, plug it into this formula plug in x sub 2, it should spit out x sub 3. So when I do that, I get negative 2 over negative 2, because the 2 times 0 cubed and 3 times 0 squared goes away. I just get negative 2 over negative 2, which is 1, which is bad because we're right back where we started. And so now if I use 
one as x3, then x4 will be two, and x5 will be one, and x6, I mean, x4 uh, will be back to zero. We see the ones get us to zero, and the zeros get us to one. And so here, Noob's method does not work because it just generates this sequence of flip-flops between zero and one. And, and so it's called cycling. It cycles between zero and one forever. It never approaches one single number. It never converges, it's diverges. And you know what's worse, I mean, even to add injury to insult, neither zero or one is a root. So it didn't even get as close to the root, you know? So in this case, the initial guess is very important. And here I did a graph so you can see what's happening. And I did a close up here. So starting with X1, you go to the function, follow the tangent line down to the x-intercept. Then from that x-intercept, go up to the function, follow the tangent line at that point to the x-intercept. We're right back where we started. And Newton's method just gets stuck in this loop forever. And so very quickly now, let me show you um, in MATLAB what happens here with this infinite loop. Um, so, oops, did that to me twice. So here we go, MATLAB, boom. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm change the function. I'm gonna comment these out. And so this is the new function for this problem. So f of x equals x cubed minus two times x plus two, and f prime, the derivative, is three, three times x squared minus two, okay? And I'm gonna start with a starting guess of one. And here, let me clear the console. So when I run this, it should just run for, so let's see, I'm gonna run it now. And there it goes. It's flip-flopping between zero. So now I have to go in the console and hit control C and break it. It's just gonna do this forever. Look, after 43,000 iterations, no progress, just flip-flops between zero and one. But look, if I change the starting point, instead of starting at one, if I start at negative one, look what happens if I start at negative one. It gets there in nine iterations, you know? So the starting point is really important here. Um, yeah, and you can see, in the graph, based on the graph, it would be smarter for me to pick a starting point that's on the you know left side of zero rather than starting at one. That that was you know pure disaster. It ended up in this cycling phenomenon. All right, folks. So that's Newton's method, and so I'm going to stop uh, right here.